everyone. Welcome to today's talk with Reimagine. Um, for those of you just connecting, we're going to get started in a few minutes, but um, until we get started, we invite all of you to go into the chat and let us know where you're calling from. We like to know where you're all from and uh, describe a word, take a word to describe how you're currently feeling right now. So just go into the chat, let us know where you're calling from and give us a word. Awesome, we already have two Canadians. All right, thank you all so much for starting to share where you are. Got some Canadians, of course, I'm happy about that. I'm Canadian. Um, some San Francisco folks, of course, Memphis, Boston, Napa. Oh, that sounds nice. Awesome, thank you all so much. Um, so I believe we should get started because it is 7.01 on my watch. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and uh, share my screen with you all and get a little presentation going to introduce everyone. So first of all, everyone, um, welcome to Collective Loss and Mobilization in a Pandemic. And of course, we'd like to thank Reimagine for hosting this event uh, with us and for us. And just a few quick housekeeping items. Uh, this is being recorded and it will be uh, republished on YouTube and Vimeo. So just letting you all know that. And towards the end, uh, we will be taking in questions and answering your questions. So of course, many of you clearly know how to use the chat, but for those of you that are not as familiar with Zoom, just go towards the bottom of your screen, click on the little chat icon, and um, you can ask the question to everyone, but if you'd like to keep it anonymous, then you're welcome to send it to one of the hosts or me, Mandy, and uh, we'll gladly mention your question, but keep it completely anonymous. So today's speakers, um, first of all, I'm gonna be speaking. My name's Mandy Benwalid, and I'm the president and the co-founder of Keeper. And Keeper is an online memorial platform. And so what we do is uh, we built an online space since uh, 2013, actually, where families can go online and create a memorial page for a loved one that has passed away. And it lets you collect memories from everyone else within your family and friends. Um, it lets you receive um, photographs and videos and really share the person's full life story. I'm also the editor of talkdeath.com and we are a death positive media site. And our goal is really to encourage constructive and healthy conversation around death and dying. And we write about many different subjects uh, around green burial, alternative funeral options, um, some of the best podcasts you should listen to, really a full gamut. So if anyone here uh, is a Talk Death follower, thank you guys so much for joining us. Um, we're excited to have you all on with us and we're gonna be publishing it afterwards as well. And our next speaker is Ayana Malcolm. And Ayana unfortunately ran into some um, mechanical issues with her car. So she is joining us over the phone. You will not be able to see her right now, but Ayana, would you like to introduce yourself to everyone? Hello, everybody. 
Um, thank you for the introduction, and thank you to everyone for bearing with just my voice this evening. Uh, as Mandy mentioned, my name is Ayanna Malcolm, and I'm here on behalf of the dinner party. Um, I began with the dinner party in 2013. I had lost my mother to breast cancer in 2007, and my father to brain cancer in 2011. And when I joined, I became a host. So that meant physically I held space in my home for about 10 people around my age, and at the time I was 31. And they had also all lost someone. And I did that for five years before joining the organization of staff. And I've seen now how beneficial our in-person peoples are in the region that I manage. I've been with the organization for three and a half years staff. But I've watched over the last few months our spaces transform from physical to virtual. And I've seen our grieving community thrive because of it. And specifically our Friday evening discussions for people of color. And I'm excited to be here because I'm excited to talk about how those virtual spaces can actually be really freeing with regards to topics. So many people of color are usually too afraid to share or, or are in spaces where they don't feel comfortable to. Um, outside of the dinner party, I'm a birth and death doula. And so I am very connected to the idea of ritual and memorialization and what that means for all involved. So thank you for having me. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ayana. And next up we have Sean, who's clearly a designer based on his wonderful slide. <laughs> oh, hey everyone, how's it going? Um, yeah, so my name is uh, Sean Mulholland and um, I've kind of worked at the intersection of art, tech and design for, for close to two decades now. It's, it's been a while since I've been at it. Um, and one of the things that, that initially connected me to reimagine was, was this notion of designing our digital legacy. Um, you know, as the techie of the family, I've, I've fallen into the role of digital archivist for several loved ones. Um, you know, everything from digitizing photos and VHS tapes uh, to backing up hard drives to the cloud. But, you know, as I've continued to explore this topic, um, it's really interesting that, you know, in our, in our modern world, in the developed world, we now have a far richer data set that we may want to pass down um, beyond just, you know, a box full of, of photos. Um, yet, oftentimes, this data tends to live in cloud services, maybe belonging to um, Facebook or Google or what have you. Um, and, you know, if we were to go, our loved ones wouldn't necessarily have access to that. I mean, sometimes those companies can go and we might not even have access to it, even if we're still around. And these companies do fail, you know, tech luminaries like MySpace have shut down and Flickr has started calling photos for non-pro accounts. Um, and, you know, today's platforms are, are no more permanent. Their, their choice to keep data online is is ruled by capitalism, not compassion. Um, but, you know, these past few months have kind of had me rethinking that view on digital preservation. Uh, obviously, over the past few months, we've seen very tragic videos uh, for people like George Floyd or Ahmaud Aubrey. And, you know, their digital legacy is not something that they're intentionally curating. Um, it's not something that they really have a lot of choice in. And, and that's something that's started to, to cause me to sort of like think differently about this whole topic. Um, you know, for, for their families, the most painful moment of tragically losing a loved one is, is now public and preserved, and they don't really have a choice to take it down anymore. And, you know, I can only imagine what this would feel like because, you know, I, I lost a brother um, when he was young in under somewhat tragic circumstances. And, you know, if there was a video of that online dominating news headlines for a month, I, I don't know how I'd cope with that. Um, in addition, the COVID-19 pandemic adds further weight to this topic. Uh, obviously, you know, we've all been experiencing this in, in many different ways, but it's interesting, even just in my own life, I had a neighbor who was hospitalized after a car accident in April and his mother and family couldn't visit him in the hospital. He had to deal with that alone. And it might've even been worse for his mother not being able to go. Um, you know, my, my wife works in labor and delivery and mothers have had to give birth alone without their partners there or their family. Um, you know, my aunt is a nurse in Manhattan and she got COVID herself. And, and sadly, a coworker that I know lost a family member to disease and she was unable to go home and visit while he was going through that and, and ultimately when, when he passed. Um, so, you know, almost overnight, digital channels kind of went from secondary to primary and, and this notion of like connecting online, um, 
is less of a second best option now. It, it's kind of become more of, of a primary option. And, you know, I've always been a believer that the digital and the physical are not necessarily separate. I've always felt that they can create real and authentic human connection. Um, and over these past few months, we've seen how that can actually turn into real world action as well. Um, and all of this kind of just makes me think, you know, I know, I know we're heading into the Q&A, but, you know, all of these things kind of make me think like, you know, when this pandemic first began, I think most of us were kind of hoping to get back to normal in those first couple of weeks. But as it's progressed, I think many of us are kind of re-evaluating what normal we really want to get back to. Uh, I think the, the global protests we've seen have shown that we don't want to go back to an unjust and inequitable normal. Um, we definitely don't want that. Um, maybe for some of us, time away from our packed schedules has shown us that, you know, the treadmill we've been on might not align with what's really important to us. So, you know, I'm excited to be here on this panel today uh, to not just reimagine end of life, but to also reimagine the life that we've been living up until this point. Awesome. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, and so to get us kind of started with this first question, um, just as Sean was saying, many of us are online all day, pretty much every day, and especially now within this pandemic. We're working online, we're socializing online, we're consuming media constantly. But when you think about it, when you go to a cemetery or you're attending a funeral service, we put our phones away, right? We turn them on silent because you do not want to be that person whose phone goes off during a eulogy, right? And we do this out of respect to the deceased. We do this out of respect to the family. And it's considered respectful because all of our energy and our focus is on remembering the life of that person. And the digital has always been seen as a distraction. And when you think about it, the intimacy and the, the immediacy of mourning, it really necessitates the creation of spaces of remembrance and memorialization. Cemeteries and mausoleums, again, are these kinds of examples of these spaces which are really designed to memorialize a life. But on top of that, they're providing that, that mental space for mourning and remembrance. But since these physical spaces have become inaccessible because of COVID, the spaces of memorialization, like online memorials, such as what we do, and virtual funerals have become popularized. And, and just as a saying, you know, our just keeper services, our user base has grown exponentially during the last few months because of this. So now finally getting to the question, um, when physical spaces of remembrance and memorialization move into the digital realm like we're seeing today, how can we create that same mental space and that same intentionality that physical spaces and gatherings provide? Sean, you want to jump in on that one first? Um, yeah, sure. So, yeah, it's a great question. And, and, you know, I guess I kind of touched upon it a little bit in the intro that I guess technology often kind of gets a bad rap. Like, it's kind of fashionable right now to say that, you know, phones are bad. Like, and that's kind of a knee jerk reaction almost that we have sometimes that, you know, our technology is instruction. But, but, you know, I think that lack of intentionality is sort of a, bias that maybe we carry carry over from mindlessly surfing like TikTok or Reddit or Facebook or whatever platform of choice uh, we may use. But, but we shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater because ultimately it's how we choose to approach technology that matters and not necessarily the medium itself. Um, you know, as an example, I, I met my wife via OkCupid, which is an online dating service, you know, this is a long time ago at this point, but like, you know, that that's an example of a real human connection that happened in a way that we might not have almost surely not wouldn't have met in any other way had it not been for that service. Um, and, you know, we have family spanning four continents, not historically, but right now. So a few decades ago, we might not have had meaningful contact with any of those people yet. Today we have WhatsApp group threads with family in Argentina and Facebook groups spanning coast to coast and into the Philippines. So, so I think that, you know, if we approach something with, with a mindset that it's meaningful, then it can be meaningful. But if we sort of default to thinking that, you know, tech equals social media equals a distraction, 
it might cause us to maybe not not look at it in a way that it that it could be, um, and not really see the true value of what's there. Yeah, definitely. Ayanna, do you want to um, add to any of that? Yes, of course. Um, I think it's important first to acknowledge kind of the elephant in the room, which is that it won't be the same. Um, I think that when we go into it, when we go into any situation, specifically when we're going into something like grief or memorialization, it's always best to speak the most honest words, right? So that we can really deal with what we're, or face what we're dealing with. I think if we're looking at it that we're not out in these physical spaces and so we're home now, then it's okay, now that I've acknowledged this isn't going to be the same, then how can I bring some of that intentionality into my home? Um, so how can I do that through setting up an intentional physical space in my home that that becomes the space I visit when I need it with my emotional pain, with my grief, or with my wanting to remember the person I've lost. I think there's also something to be said for if you're coming into this sort of space like a funeral with a group of people, whether it's friends or family, to sit down beforehand and have guidelines of how we're going to do this so that everyone feels supported and held and that we're doing this with honor for the person that we've lost. I think that long term, when I think about my own grief, and now that I'm about 10 years out, a little bit more than that, actually, I think one of the upsides, and I hate to say upside, but by not being surrounded by people and not being surrounded by the way that they're managing their grief, it allows you to manage your own and to be at home and to really sit with what you're feeling and, and to be able to remember the person that the way that you'd like to. Outside of, you know, PDP, I've been a yoga and meditation teacher for 15 years, and we talk a lot in yoga about sitting with the shadows. Um, and I think that there's a healing that can come long term when you're almost forced to sit with pain in the short term. Um, and so as somebody who's a little further out, I, I would have welcomed a little more time to sit with me and less to manage the expectations of, of people around me. So almost in a way you would say that this pandemic is allowing people to grieve in an almost healthier way for themselves. I think it's allowing people to, to deal with themselves and deal with their loss in a more authentic way than they would have. Um, I think we can see it, you know, if you are in, let's say, a family of a mother, father, brother, and sister, and you lose somebody in that immediate network, you're all grieving differently. And oftentimes you're having to balance um, other people's reactions to your grief and then your reactions to theirs or lack thereof sometimes. I think that there's a, you know, I myself, when it came to the loss of my father, I hated the way that he was. He was cremated. I wasn't happy with it. I wasn't happy with the way that the family handled it. There are situations like that that happen to a lot of people. And I would have welcomed the, the ability to sit home and to really honor him the way that felt right to me and not what felt right to the seven siblings uh, of him. And that's, I think, a truth for people. Um, and I think anytime you're able to access more authenticity in your life um, and to break through those barriers of emotion that most of us uphold when we're around people, I think you do yourself, you're at least your future self a service. Yeah, wow, that's really interesting. And I mean, because what's interesting that something that we hear a lot about, you know, grief and loss is that it's supposed to be, or you're supposed to try to become part of a collective and, and you're supposed to get support from family and friends and your community. And that's some of the typical advice that we see a lot, right? And so when we're in this pandemic situation, I feel like, I feel like people may have felt really isolated um, in their grief. And, um, but I think what, what you mentioned, I think is really interesting that we're kind of 
we're, we're being forced almost into this situation that may be uncomfortable at first, but then may allow us to sit and reflect in a way that we would not normally have if we had all of these people around us. Um, mm -hmm. And what I think is also interesting, and I mean, I'm saying this as someone, and I'm, and I'm sure Sean has, has a similar opinion on this um, as, as a designer and someone who's working in tech, is that, you know, we're talking about right now, we're in a pandemic, we don't have the ability to gather uh, when someone dies. And so creating these digital spaces of remembrance, I think can be important. And I think creating the intentionality sort of to go alongside the question um, is a big reason why I think Keeper was built and why other online memorial spaces exist because it's just a way, just like how cemeteries are like a demarcated space to go somewhere and to remember someone. That's why, you know, a lot of people were seeing, uh, not to rag on Facebook at all, but why some people, for example, are not creating memorial pages on Facebook. They're creating it in a separate space that is really meant for that. Um, so I think that that's interesting and a big part of it is the way that this tech is being designed. Sean, do you have any kind of thoughts on that as? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is, it is interesting to think about. I mean, you know, geography is difficult in my life and, and family, I suppose. Um, you know, I'm not where I grew up and, um, and yeah, you know, the generation above me, everyone immigrated here from somewhere. Um, so, and the same with my, with my partner's family. So, so it's, there's not really like, there's not really a singular place that we can go to, even if we want to visit everyone's graves, it would take weeks of travel and flights. And, you know, even pre COVID that was very difficult to do. Um, so this notion of virtualization, I think is not, um, it's not a bad thing in the sense that it's not sort of like, you know, uh, a cheaper or, or kind of, you know, discount version of the real thing. But, but I think it actually can sort of become the main way that, that, that one can approach those spaces. Um, especially when, you know, again, when geography is, is an issue. So, you know, there's not really like, it's kind of difficult to think about like, where, where could I kind of visit that, you know, and, and I actually really like what I am said around maybe creating a space in the home and, and having those kind of spaces locally and not sort of relying on having to head somewhere else, you know? Um, because if the only time I allowed myself to think about those things is like when I visited a gravesite, um, that might only happen a couple times every couple of years, you know? So, so yeah, I, I think that, you know, having a space that's yours to address that and maybe having some way to share that even if the people that you care about aren't necessarily physically nearby um, yeah, I think it's something that we as a society haven't necessarily thought enough of yet. And, and I don't know, these times that we're in right now, I think are sort of forcing us to, to consider it when maybe we wouldn't have thought about it before. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, this, just going on sort of the same vein, um, one of our, one question that I really wanted to talk to everyone about is that digital environments have been traditionally thought of as secondary to the physical. And the question really is, can, can digital experiences be considered as authentic as their physical counterparts? And um, to kind of start off this, this question, I thought I would um, share something that personally um, happened to, to myself and my family during this pandemic. Um, my grandmother, unfortunately, was, was diagnosed with COVID. Uh, she was one of the only people in, in the nursing home. And, um, you know, a few days later, she passed away. Unfortunately, it was just too hard on her body. And um, I come from a Jewish background where the person is usually interred uh, the next day, if possible, if it's not a holiday. And there is a funeral service, and then there are seven days of Shiva. And for anyone that's been to a Shiva, um, typically they're, they could be really fun. Um, it's just a house crowded with family and friends literally for seven days straight. And um, if that's, you know, that's like to me, like the definition of community gathering in, in time of hardship and, and coming together. Um, so of course this was very different than what my family has experienced because we couldn't gather. 
and some of us are all in different parts of, of Canada and the US. So what we did is we did an online, we did a virtual funeral service for her. And what was interesting and something that we never do, generally because the funeral service happened so quickly after a death, um, we actually created a slideshow where we, the whole family got together physical, uh, uh, virtually and um, everyone sent me all their photographs and we put together um, a slideshow and myself and some of my cousins, everyone uh, actually was able to say something. Whereas typically during a funeral service, there's not a lot uh, during a traditional Jewish one, there's not a lot of time for family to really speak. And so we had, you know, a closed Zoom with our family. We all, the, 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 all my cousins and myself, we, we spoke about our memories, we showed pictures. And it was, um, it was just such a beautiful service. And my family received so many thanks and praises afterwards because it was something that, that they haven't experienced before. So in my experience, answering the question, can digital experiences be considered as authentic as their physical counterparts? To be honest, it felt more authentic. Um, it, like, it, it just felt so much more personalized that we were so involved in it and that we, were, we had that access where we could do that. Um, so that, that's, that's a story that, that I wanted to share because it's so connected to this. Um, does anyone else have anything to add to, to that question? Yeah, I would love to. Um, yeah, I would love to. I think there's three things I think about when I think about the authenticity that can be created in virtual spaces. And one, the dinner party doesn't just do um, general dinner parties. Uh, we also do them for affinity loss. So whether it's child loss, um, whether it's homicide, sibling loss, uh, drug loss, for people of color is a group that I gather on Friday. And what I've seen in all of those spaces are the benefits for extroverts, but also the introverts. And I think for the extroverts, because we're in this pandemic lifestyle of everyone being home, it's giving them a way to see people again and connect. But I think for the introverts, it's allowing those people that are usually quiet and too shy to actually have space to speak up which I think has been beautiful. I've seen people that I've never heard from before all of a sudden have a voice. I'm also seeing that because people are in their homes, they're much more willing to share the emotional parts of their physical spaces. Uh, so in one of our groups, we talked about sharing those spaces where you feel emotionally held in your home. And for a lot of people, that was an altar. For some people, it was a bookshelf. But those are things that you're not able to normally share if you're leaving your home and going someplace else. Um, so I think it becomes really personal for people. Um, and I think people want to be heard and that's important for humans, especially right now. And the third thing I notice is that when we sit in physical spaces, I think sometimes we, not for all of us, I think I'm somebody who's quite comfortable in emoting, but not everyone is like that. And when you sit in someone else's home or somebody else's space, or perhaps you're at a, a funeral home and you're surrounded by people, there are often people who hold back because they don't feel comfortable emoting at a certain level, right? They don't feel comfortable crying in public. And what I see is that in our virtual spaces, people are able to, if they need to, they turn their camera off, they mute their phone. They're able to say, you know what, I need a minute, and they go take a walk, or they go grab a drink from the fridge. Whatever it is, it gives them that break. But I think them being home and not being in other people's energy allows them to really feel and to let go. And I think that's just been incredible to watch. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, I mean, that, that's really interesting that it I hadn't thought of it that way, but that's a great observation that, you know, as much as those of us who spend a lot of time on Zoom might complain about it, it, it can be sort of a, a great equalizer um, in that sense. And, and I think that, you know, I mean, I guess the story that I might share is, is you know, thankfully we, our family hasn't had any, uh, had any 
you know, major tragedies over the past few months. Uh, so, you know, knock on wood for that. Um, but there's, there's a number of us who happen to have birthdays in late May, all within like a few days of each other. And we organized kind of a family reunion birthday call kind of thing. And we had never done that prior to, to our current situation, even though we could have, like the technology has been here for a long, long time. And, and, you know, I think that that's an example where because we kind of had to, we did. And it actually was in some ways, you know, a, a net add to our life. Like normally we would have waited until we all happened to be in one place to do some kind of family reunion, but our family's done that a couple of times ever since I moved away from home, you know? So it kind of makes one think like, well, why weren't we doing that more often? Why shouldn't we do that more often? Why isn't that more of a regular thing? Um, so, so again, kind of coming back to that notion of like, you know, is digital really second best or is it just underutilized or utilized in ways that maybe aren't very human? And I think that when we sort of, you know, post to Instagram and like each other's posts and kind of assume like, oh, I'm keeping up with someone because I've liked their posts and they like mine and therefore we're staying in touch. That's not quite, I mean, it is in some level like keeping up with each other, but it's not quite the same as staying in touch. But I think because maybe we wait for those physical moments, because we wait for those times when we're face to face, sometimes we just end up waiting so long that the reality is we connect a lot less, at least for those of us who, who aren't necessarily living close to home. Um, so yeah, it is interesting to think about like, you know, how and when and why we choose to connect online. And just because certain platforms are the most convenient to us doesn't necessarily mean that they're the best ways that we should connect. Yeah, so like the authenticity is really about the intention, is, is, is all around the intentions of it. Because when you're scrolling, and that kind of brings us back to the intentionality of going to a cemetery to remember someone, right? Mm -hmm. Is you're kind of just scrolling through Instagram, your intention is to not be bored. Whereas when you're having a Zoom call um, with family or friends, um, or doing it for a memorial service, your intentions are there. And in that way, it makes the technology more meaningful. It, exactly, yeah. yeah. And I, I think it is kind of like the intention is everything that the technology is just a medium or a channel. Um, one could, in theory, show up in person and totally disengage and not speak to anyone. I mean, like face to face isn't by default automatically better um, if one doesn't approach that with intentionality, too. So so I think that that's maybe something that that I've been trying to that I've been thinking more about um, during the pandemic is that, you know, we're not forced to use the second best option We're we're using what we have and it's just how we use it that really makes it, you know, either meaningful or not. Yeah. And, and just, just to, to repeat what, what Ayana said that it can, um, it can actually make these face-to-face -face interactions replaceable for people with social anxiety, for people who um, are physically disabled or disabled in general, who cannot, you know, go somewhere mentally or physically. So I think that that's really key. And hopefully this pandemic will highlight, especially to employers, that there are workers that don't work well in physical spaces. And uh, I, I hope that that does change, um, you know, policies w within organizations in particular. Mm -hmm. um, so moving on to to one of the next questions that we wanted to touch on. Um, it's all about creating space. And the, the mandatory self-isolation that this pandemic um, ha has necessitated has also created this space. And the space is picking up a hobby or focusing on our health, as I think you mentioned, Sean. But more importantly, it's created this mental space for us to have difficult conversations, for us to reflect, for us to educate ourselves. And of course, I, I do want to say that not everyone has been privileged enough to have this space because some people have been left with less mental space and more grief and more stress and busier work schedules. So, you know, we, we see those people. Um, and a huge part of that as well is that our society is, you know, values productivity. And many of us fall victim to this expectation. And with that, that space we have for reflection and for remembrance has shrunk or you know, completely vanished. 
And, and we're really, and I think Sean, you had mentioned this in one of our conversations, we're, we're lost in the future because we're constantly preparing for what's next. And so COVID really broke this dynamic, giving us a lot more of this space. And with regards to the recent murders of George Floyd and Ahmaud Aubrey, Breonna Taylor, unfortunately, that's just a few of the many names. Um, and the fact that they, that they were killed during this pandemic, do you all think that society would have had the space to come to this realization? Would, would the Black Lives Matter movement we are seeing be so present without this extra space that we've had in the last few months? And what does that say about our society that we don't have that space? Well, I'd love to touch on that. Um, I think that the answer is no. I don't think that we ever would have, uh, would have been where we are right now had the pandemic not happened. You know, I've, I've been saying uh, to people in my own tribe that, you know, I don't love the word pandemic. I don't love the word COVID. I feel like it instills fear in the mind. And so I've been looking at it as like a reset. Um, and I think what this reset has done is it's forced everybody to sit down and to reevaluate all these things that we thought that we had control over and we thought that we knew. And I think one of the biggest things has been race, right? And I think then the trickle down effect of how, of how that's impacted so many other things. I think that for black people, for people of color, what is happening in the news, what's happening on social media, None of it is new for us. We've all been aware that this has been happening and these are conversations we've been having in our own community. I think what is new is that white people now have also been told to sit down and they are now paying attention because now it's being filmed. And now we have more time to do scrolling and now we have more time to, to check out other people's feeds and not just our own or to diversify our feeds like we're all being asked to to learn. I think that it's forcing conversations and it's forcing people to look at what they thought their own identity or their own relationship to their race was. I think it's forcing people to look at where they stand on certain matters and then whether or not they're going to move forward and act on that. Um, I think that this huge cloud umbrella of what's happening in the civil rights movement is then forcing people to look at their mental health and how they're handling things, how black people are managing this on top of their work, on top of COVID, um, how our white allies are handling how they're going to stand up for us and also stand in their own communities and disrupt those. I think we're seeing our relationships have changed because now because of these deep, uncomfortable racial conversations, we're seeing who was a friend and who was showing up because it was a good time, because now we're not able to go out for drinks and distract ourselves. Now we're forced to have actual conversations. Um, I think it's forcing us to look at what life is going to look like afterwards, because do we want to show up as who we were before, or now that we have all of this knowledge and all of this awareness that what we've been taught is wrong, then who are we afterwards? Um, and I don't know that any of that would have happened had it not been that we were told and forced to sit in our home. Um, and it is uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable for everyone involved. Um, I think that as a black woman, I am thrilled would be the wrong word, but I am happy to know that what we have been going through is now being seen and talked about and that what we have been having as silent conversations are now being forced into mainstream conversations. I don't know that the support for my people would have been there if this reset hadn't happened. Yeah, that's powerful. Sean, do you want to add to that? Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, yeah, I mean, first of all, plus one to all of that. Um, I totally agree. And, you know, I was speaking to a friend the other day who said, you know, if the past few months haven't made you look at the world differently, then 
there's something wrong with you, you know? And I, and I, I hate to say that with sort of like a finger pointing tone, but he, he was saying it in kind of reference to himself. And, and you know, it kind of made me think of, uh, you know, there, there's a political uh, or an anthropology professor at Cal, UC Berkeley, um, who was actually born and raised in the Soviet Union and kind of looked back in his time there and coined this term, this term called hypernormalization, um, which is a term that he used to describe Soviet society in like the final decade of the USSR. And basically what, what it means is that people kind of looked around and realized things were wrong, realized that like this isn't necessarily working out how it should, but were so hyper-normalized into their, their world that they couldn't imagine anything else. So they just had to kind of carry on and hope that it would work itself out. And, and I bring up that example not to you know, draw parallels to, to us in the USSR, but, but it's kind of this notion that you know six months ago, I think that you know, or I should actually say even now, even now we're kind of seeing this push by many people that we just need to get back to normal. We just need to, you know, I don't want to wear a mask. We should reopen the schools. We should all go back to normal and everything will be fine and it'll just work itself out. And I, and I kind of feel like that's a sort of hyper-normalized worldview where, you know, being unable to kind of see that things can and should be different, that, that there are things that we can do to make society better. Like that, that just feels like, you know, this time that we've had, forced upon us and, and you know, often tinged with, with sadness or frustration, um, but nonetheless has given us that time to reflect and, and kind of see that maybe things can and should be different. Um, I don't know that the response, uh, the protest that we saw about a month and a half ago would have been so strong had there not been, you know, so many people would have been distracted in traffic and getting, picking up the kids and doing all these other things. They might not have had that time. And, and I think that the time they had even before that leading up to it was that time to take a pause and kind of say like, oh, wow, how am I living? How are we as a society living? Like, is this the direction we all want to be going in? Um, so yeah, it's really interesting to see how, you know, th there, there's sort of a large, you know, tens, hundreds of millions of people that, that are kind of seeing a different way that we could be headed. And, but yet there are some people that I feel like are hyper-normalized and are just kind of like, nope, it'll all just go away and we'll be back to how it was in 2019 and everything will be fine and the economy will roar. And, and yeah, I just kind of feel like, you know, I kind of feel like it's, it's naive to think that it will all just go back to normal or at least the normal that we had, you know, six plus months ago. Definitely, um, I, I agree to that. And I hope that things don't go back to normal and, and I feel like we can sort of mirror in a way or, or definitely find similarities in um, the Me Too movement that, that we saw where it's, it's this thing that was right in, it, it was, it's been right in front of us this whole time. And us, I mean, essentially white people this whole time and we didn't realize it or we realized it, but we pushed it to the back of our minds. And now that we had this space, we were able to talk about it more. But what I think is so interesting is we're, we're seeing that that's, a similarity where, you know, fathers and brothers would ask their daughters and wives, you know, is it really that bad? Like, it's really that bad to be a woman in today's society. And I think we're, and now people are coming to this realization with the Black Lives Matter movement. But on top of that, what I think people still don't realize is that, yes, there's systematic racism in place and people are being murdered. But on top of that, African Americans and people of color are dying at three times the rate of white Americans during the pandemic. And and that and that's like that, that's a pretty tough statistic to sit with, right? So I think that that is another thing that's really important to realize right now. And on top of that, going back to, you know, returning to the normal, I think it's important for us to continue to have these conversations, but just like Think about it and just like the way you would do it with a grieving friend. Just sending a text message saying, hey, is there anything I can do for you? Versus calling Uber, calling, wow, I'm old school, going on Uber Eats and sending them dinner or just knocking on the door and giving them a little something and really being there or just sitting and being with them with their grief. I think we have to think about um, 
this Black Lives Matter movement in a similar way where you're posting a black square, you're posting something on your stories on Instagram almost as a performative thing, whereas actually being an ally. Um, so I think that it's important for us to show up when it comes to grief, when we're talking about grief, but then also when it comes to talking about standing up for people who are underprivileged or people who are systematically targeted. I'd love to touch on that. Please, yes. I feel like because there's no, there's no face, I'm just like unmuting and randomly saying things. <laughs> but I, you know, I love that you just brought that back to grief. And, you know, I remember after losing my parents that somebody gave me a quote and it said, I don't know who said it, but I carried this little piece of paper around with me for years. And it said that in the midst of my grief, I had no room for bullshit. And I feel like as a, as a black woman, I think I can speak for the community when we say we have no room for bullshit in this moment. Um, there is a pandering and a performative uh, behavior that's happening that seems a lot more like people just want to be part of a movement, um, but not be part of the action. When I think about who I remember from my grieving time, I remember the girls who drove hours and sat with me at my mother's bedside. You know, I remember the people who came and made sure that I showered. Um, I don't remember the random text. I don't remember the person who signed the guest book. I remember the person who cooked dinner for me for a week. Um, I think there, this is a time right now for action. All that your black friends want to hear is what are you doing? Um, I think that what is amazing about being in a virtual space during this time is that there's no excuse not to be active. The virtual space makes it so easy for you to join in and for you to be an activist and to be anti-racist. Um, and I think at this point, in order for things to change, that has to be the, the shift in thinking is that this is not a self-reflection exercise, right? This isn't just sit home, read, and learn. This is sit home, read, unlearn, and then do. Um, and then speak up about what you're doing so that your fellow white people know how to mirror your behavior. Um, and if there's ever a way to do that, it's through the virtual space by using your platform to say, this is what I did, this is the number I called, this is the website I used. Um, I think you can be so extremely powerful in your voice from your couch right now. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and right now what we're gonna do is we're gonna move on to some Q and A. So if you um, have a question for anyone on the panel, it doesn't have to be for everybody, it could be just for a particular person, uh, please go in to the chat and um, add them in as well. And so I'm just, um, some people have asked some questions around, um, can we see examples of digital spaces of remembrance? Um, is there a list of the available options for end of life or digital options? Um, so, I mean, I would first of all be wrong in, in not just telling you a bit about Keeper. So um, Keeper is one of those options, but if you, um, if you Google, uh, best online memorial platforms, as an example. There's a few websites that have done a few lists that um, compare some of them. So it depends on what your needs are. Um, if someone is, if you are interested, for example, in creating a virtual memorial service, um, we can always send this out in a link after, but we've even written about um, some options and some guides on how to do it, doing it on something like Zoom, just like this where you can have family and friends join in and just like I did with my grandmother, um, talk about their life, share videos and stories. Um, does anyone else have any suggestions, um, Sean or Ayana, about creating or about end of life digital virtual spaces that you want to recommend? Yeah, I think, yeah, you've covered a lot of the, the platforms and things like that. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, I would additionally encourage, you know, uh, I don't know, some, some of the work that I've been doing and thinking about in this space has been kind of like archiving and preserving data and, and thinking about those things like, you know, cassette tapes can fade away or 
what if there's a time when there's no CD players or DVD players or things like that? So, you know, I would just uh, keep some of that in mind in terms of like how you might, um, like what you might want to put into that space, like in terms of the content that would go into it, especially if you're thinking more long-term, um, you know, technology tends to change and just because we can access it now doesn't mean we may, may be able to in the future. So um, yeah, just keeping a, an eye towards like how we might preserve and, and protect our data. And I know data is kind of a analytical term for it, but, but you know, I, I think that, you know, if I lost, I, I've screenshotted the first message I sent to my wife back when from, from OkCupid, like I have that screenshot saved, like, because who knows whether that service will still exist in years. And then that's sort of like our first letter to each other, our first date in a weird way. So like, so like little things like that. Um, and then, yeah, I think that, you know, in terms of, you know, how you choose to surface that information to a few people or, or publicly post it or whatever, I think that's kind of up to the individual, but, but yeah, it's an, it's an interesting thing to think about what goes into those spaces beyond just the fact that those spaces exist. Awesome. And, and as Dara had added in um, the, uh, the chat, uh, Reimagine even published their own virtual memorial guide, um, virtualmemorialguide.com, great domain. Um, so you can all access that as well, which will give you some more um, explanation. Um, so before we continue on to some other questions, th there's one that, that I do kind of want us to, to touch on before we jump into other ones, which is how do we think that, um, or what do we think will permanently change after the pandemic? How do we think it will have changed us in the future? And this could be regards to grief and loss and memorialization. It's about um, politics and protest and mobilizing within a movement. Um, does anyone have thoughts on that? Or even what you hope the future would be like, will be like. Yeah, I mean, I think I have, I have hopes um, for what I hope this brings out in people. I hope that we've all taken this time. And I, you know, I say this, and I know that it's almost a privilege to say slow down. I understand that we're not all in the situation, the same situation, and that some people are home with children and are homeschooling and are working from home. And so the idea of slowing down sounds a bit silly. Um, but what I mean by that is that we have at least looked at this as we've taken stock of how quickly things can change. Um, you know, and I think those of us who have dealt uh, intimately with loss, I know for, for a lot of us, that was the shift for us was like, wow, life can completely change very quickly. And so how can I live my life differently? I kind of look at this as the same. We're all dealing with this collective grief. Um, and so I hope for everyone what I got for myself, which was that I looked at the years I had and I said, it's totally possible that I'm not going to have all of them. And so how am I going to live a life that brings me joy in the present moment? Something that I can look back on and be proud of. Something that when I find myself at the end, I'm not like, damn, I wish I had of. Um, I hope that's what everyone is doing right now. And, then, and I think that there is, a, there is something to be said about what grows out of extreme pain and loss and grief. Um, and for a lot of us, we, we watched an incredible strength rise out of that. Um, I didn't know how strong I was until I had to bury two people. I don't think a lot of us have known how strong we are until we've had to lose someone to COVID or lose a job and be unsure or protest on the front lines or show up for our black friends or speak up when we are normally uncomfortable. Um, all of those things are making us see how strong and valuable we are. And I hope that we're taking those lessons and applying it to, to what can be a much braver life afterwards. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I don't even have much to add to that. I think I know you covered covered all of it. I mean, uh, you know, I guess the only thing I might add is kind of like, you know, as a society, how might we want to better shape our society so that it's less painful the next time one of these things happen? I mean, 
what we're, what we're seeing right now might be a once in generation event, but you know, I hopefully anyway have another generation worth of life left in me, which means there's probably going to be another time where something like this happens. And then by then I'll have children and what will it be like for them? And, you know, even in my own family, there have been people furloughed and on unemployment and those benefits could be expiring pretty soon. You know, like what happens to the world when we don't have that kind of safety net and when people are at the edge kind of all the time, um, you know, healthcare is tremendously expensive and a health crisis just seems insane to me. And, and yeah, I, I just hope that we can kind of think about the changes we want to make um, in addition to the changes we make in ourselves, but think about how we want to change our society so that we can better take care of ourselves and each other. I, I think that that's, that's an important thing. Um, and that's, that's one of my hopes that, that, you know, in the next few years, we'll see some steps in that direction. Awesome. We have um, one more question, which is, tragedy makes people come together or connect in community, but how can we preemptively come together and connect and rally behind positive change? So we are going to sort of end off the talk on that question. Um, does anyone have an opinion on that? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think, you know, as a black woman to, while it's beautiful to watch how many people have rallied, it is sad that it has taken so many people to die to do so. Um, I think that there are ways to be involved. There are so many groups to join. There are so many beautiful people to follow. There is so much joy out there. Um, and I think that to have technology at your fingertips right now, um, means that you can access all of that. So I do mean, I think it means you have to go out and look for it. You know, like we, we most of us are on Instagram, search other hashtags, you know, like ask your friends who they follow. Um, look up things that your topics that you're interested in and then see what groups come up and then join them. Um, I think there's a way to show up for people and to show up for ourselves before we're in dire straits. You know, and I look at it like, in yoga, we talk about it, or in grief, forget just in yoga or spirituality, in wellness, whether that's emotional or, or physical, we talk about equipping yourself with tools for your tool belt and knowing what it is that, that brings you happiness and joy so that when you feel yourself low and, and flattering, that's staggering, that's not really the right word, but when you feel yourself flailing, that you know what to reach for. If you can set yourself up for success before, then you don't have to wait for awful things to happen. Um, but I do think that, you know, the biggest thing behind that is looking at yourself as something that you need, you matter, and your joy matters, and your mental health matters. Um, and so those are important things to, to research and to put intention behind. Um, so that should something happen, you already have a place to land. Um, and when it comes to supporting communities, you know, you don't have to wait for somebody to have a cop's knee on his neck. You know, you can support black businesses. You can show up at black organizations that are doing beautiful things that have nothing to do with racial injustice, but just because you love the people. So research. Yes, absolutely. Research and follow your intuition and don't let your ego um, cloud your judgment. Um, and learn from other people and listen. And I think that's all amazing advice. And um, that went by really fast. So thank you all so, so much for joining us. Um, I have this screen up, feel free to screenshot it, but uh, I believe we're gonna send out a follow-up email and we'll have some of our uh, socials. Um, of course, Ayana has like a hundred, so definitely, uh, check her out and uh, find all of the other wonderful work she's doing. Um, and so a really big thank you to Reimagine, to Dara and Ellen who have helped us with this event and uh, to Ayana and Sean for talking to us about with your expertise and your experience. Uh, it really means a lot.
Um, so I guess we're going to sign off now. Um, thank you so much, everyone, and have a great rest of your week. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks so much.